can't have a plan in pioneering technology. The only way to maximize the speed at which we achieve this goal, uh, some really ambitious goal like eliminating aging, to minimize the time it takes to get there, is to try a lot of things all at the same time, because you never know what's going to work. So that means you have to mobilize a lot of people. And above all, it means that you have to mobilize a lot of money. Hi, everybody. My name is Nicholas. And today uh, we will interview Aubrey de Grey. Uh, Aubrey uh, is, is very known in the rejuvenation uh, science space. And uh, he uh, recently, uh, recently, around uh, two years ago, uh, he uh, founded uh, a new foundation uh, called Longevity Escape uh, Velocity Foundation. So now we will talk a bit about, about uh, the, the, the news in his new foundation. Hi, hi, Aubrey. How are you? Hello, Nicholas. I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay, uh, Aubrey, this is your third foundation. I mean... Uh, a quarter of a century uh, making science in, in this in this area, and this is a, an interview uh, that uh, we will focus on the Spanish speaking uh, world. So, can you uh, tell uh, the, the audience uh, what's the main aim of this new foundation, uh, Lev Foundation? So yeah, LEV Foundation is really a continuation of what I have done for the past 20 or more years. The main thing that is different about it is that now we are doing the last stage of laboratory work to implement the science plan. Now, when I say the last stage, what I mean is combining things, treatments that already work individually to a small extent. So, as you know, the whole concept of sense, the concept of down repair, which I first put forward 24 years ago, is a divide and conquer concept. It says that the way to postpone the health problems of late life is to repair lots of different types of damage, all at the same time in the same people. And that is inherently a two-stage research program. First of all, you need to develop the individual repair treatments for each of the types of damage, and then you need to put them together into the same animal and eventually the same person at the same time. Now, when you do that second part, you're going to make new discoveries. You're going to find out what things work well together, what things work badly together. So that's a very important part. And it's only now, in the past few years, that some of the individual treatments have started to work well enough in mice that we have something to combine, that we can start doing this second stage. So LEV Foundation right now is focused on that. And uh, I mean, you are for so long in, in this in this field, and uh, now you 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 are able to uh, have a a view of uh, perspective. Uh, so now, two thousand twenty four. Uh, do you think that the rejuvenation? Uh, will arrive, for example, for you or for someone of your age? So we are still too far away from completing this research and getting it to work in people for it to be possible to make an accurate prediction of how soon it will be finished. We can still only give a probabilistic prediction. But... That's okay, because that probabilistic prediction that I give now is a lot better than it was even 10 years ago. I now think that we are within 12 to 15 years of having a 50% chance 
to get this all working, to reach this thing that I have called longevity, escape velocity. And 10 years ago, I was saying, well, probably 20 years. So we have not really slipped. We have pretty much kept up the pace of what I was expecting 10 years ago. Whereas the previous 10, it wasn't like that at all. When I started to make predictions about the timeframes, that was 20 years ago. And I said, yeah, I think it's going to be 20 or 25 years. So in other words, for the first 10 years that I was working on this and making these predictions, really, we were making almost no progress. And in the second 10 years, the most recent 10 years, we've made a lot of progress. So I'm pretty optimistic. But still, we cannot be sure. Yeah. Oh, regarding specifically this first um, trial with the rat, with the mice in, in Lab Foundation, uh, I read your last uh, update. And uh, I mean, obviously, the, 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 the lifespan uh, measurement c cannot be done now, uh, but many rats already uh, died. So we can uh see some trends can um so can you sum sum up the 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 main trends regarding the four different treatments yeah so you're quite right we can only talk about trends at this point certainly nothing can be considered to be statistically significant yet but it's looking pretty interesting it seems that the mice that are getting all four of these treatments are doing a lot better than the mice that are not getting the treatments. And indeed, we have some mice, of course, who are getting just one of the four treatments, and we have some mice that are getting three of the four treatments. And it seems to be pretty additive. So the mice that are getting one treatment are doing a little bit better than the mice that are getting none. And the mice that are getting three are doing better than that. And the mice that are getting all four are doing the best. That's the situation with the female mice. With male mice, it's a bit more complicated. There are a couple of treatment groups that are getting three treatments and they're doing rather badly and we don't know why. But we will have to see whether that continues. This is the point when quite a lot of mice are dying where you expect to see a lot of noise, a lot of fluctuations from one month to the next. And um, so I will be continuing to put out updates. Actually, I was just preparing the next update today. I'll probably post it tomorrow. And, um, you know, we shall see. We can, at the moment, we can say that all the treatments are interesting. Some of them may be working better than others. Some of them may be working um, you know, very well in combination. That's what we want to find out here. But at the moment, it's just too early to say anything more than that. It's interesting that um, the four treatments, uh, uh, the, the two treatments that, that are going better are um, rapamycin and uh, telomerase, uh, I read in your last report, but uh, it's it's uh, curious that those those treatments are not included in your um, in what we used to call the sense rapamycin and uh, telomerase, uh, and in fact the senolytics that it's 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 indeed inserted in sense is not going and so well and the other is uh stem cells stem cells so uh, my point is um now you are uh more experienced and uh, with everything that happened in the net in the in the last you know the last years so how you see the um basic basic science of course, you are trying it in, in mice, you are applying in, in mammals, but regarding the, 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 the basic science, how do you see the, the currently situation? Okay, then let me say quite a lot of things. So first of all, 
as you say, this is basic science in a way. We do not really know what's going to work and what isn't going to work. And the most important thing about basic science is not to draw conclusions until you can. So that's why I'm still very cautious. At the moment, you're quite right, in my last update, I pointed out that two of the treatments, the um, rapamycin and the telomerase, seem to be doing a bit better than the other two treatments, the synolytic and the blood stem cells, the bone marrow transplant. But it's too early to say whether that will really pan out. Even supposing it does pan out, we have to look very closely at what that means. The uh, synolytic and the bone marrow transplant were the two really difficult interventions. We had to do a lot of injections to for, for both of those things. Whereas rapamycin, it's just in the diet, and um, the telomerase was just a gene therapy. So it might be that it's the um, it's the way that the treatment was delivered that needs to be improved. And we are going to be able to investigate that because we were clever when we designed the experiment. We're going to be able to look closely in the end at whether the method of delivery was in some way bad for the mice. It kind of counteracted the benefits of the actual treatment. Um, there's more than that. The um, the telomerase, as you say, is not part of sense, uh, but that's because to, telomeres, telomerase works very differently in mice than it does in humans. Um, in fact, it's quite surprising that increasing telomerase levels is good for mice because mice already make a lot of telomerase naturally. But multiple groups, research groups, have published very good studies showing that it works. And we kind of understand why it is. It's basically because mice are just incredibly bad at maintaining the DNA in their telomeres. So even though they already make a bunch of telomerase, giving them some more does help them. Whereas humans, we wouldn't do the same thing. So that's when, as you know, we are not only doing these experiments in order to find out what would work in humans, we're also doing them for rhetorical purposes to show that the that the lifespan of a mammal can be radically increased even with treatments that we start doing in middle age. As for rapamycin, you're again quite right. Rapamycin is not a damage repair intervention at all. It's a calorie restriction mimetic mainly. And so you may ask, why did we include it at all? Really, the only reason we included it was because it is by far the most robust, the most uh, widely reproduced intervention that works in mice, except for calorie restriction itself, which is much harder to do. Um, so we wanted to include it. But actually, next time when we do the second experiment like this, we're just going to give all the mice rapamycin as a baseline so that they will so that we can compare what happens with actual with with damage repair interventions in a background that is as healthy as possible okay yes um so you intend to achieve uh mouse robust rejuvenation in the, in this uh experiment or i mean do you think it will be achieved in in the second phase or in the, or the third phase? Because okay, two things, two, two things to say about that. First of all, we don't intend anything in science. We just try our best. If it works, it works. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And you know, we keep we keep on trying until it works. The second thing I want to clarify is that the definition that I use today, use these days for robust mass rejuvenation is not quite the same as the one that I used to use 20 years ago. Back then, you are quite right, I used to say we need to treble the remaining lifespan of mice that are already in middle age. And not only that, I said that we must start with exceptionally long-lived mice, mice that have an average lifespan of three years. 
none of the standard strains have that. So I said, we're gonna, we should start at two years of, old, of age in mice that normally live to three on average and get them out to five. And now I say, it's okay to start with mice that normally live to only two and a half years and to start at one and a half years. And it's okay to only double the lifespan rather than treble it. So you may ask, why have I changed my definition? And the answer is very simple. The definition has always been based on what I think is going to be necessary in order that my colleagues, the other prominent people in the field, will be able, will feel able to go out on stage and on camera and say, yeah, you know, this proves that we are close to getting re rejuvenation to really work. So why has it changed? It's changed because my colleagues have become more optimistic already and more, uh, no, more willing to say optimistic things. Let's say that uh, you achieve uh, the robust mouse rejuvenation in this experiment or in the second phase or in the third phase, I don't know. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you intend to, as soon as you achieve this, move to another mammal like pigs or non-human primates? So, of course, a lot of, in fact, most of the way in which I make decisions about what to work on is determined by what other people are working on. I identify things that need to be done and that other people are not doing. And so I make the most difference that way. So in the, in the context of your question, I will look at the situation and I will say, right, well, you know, is everybody listening? Is everybody seeing that um, this, this is working in mice? And if they are, if they're seeing that it's working and they are saying, right, let's do this in dogs or let's do this in monkeys or even let's move some of it to clinical trials immediately, right, in humans, you know, then... I will not do it because other people are doing it and they may have maybe they have more money than me and so on. What I would do instead in that situation is I would try to get further in mice. I would maybe use other strains of mice or I would combine more interventions like 10 interventions instead of only four, things like that. Um, because we want to get as much as possible. The further we can get, the more the easier it will be to persuade the general public that it's okay to get their hopes up, right? And that's really what it's all about because that's where public policy changes, where we get governments to start putting proper money into this, which is the ultimate goal. Yeah, uh, but in terms of public re reception, there is a very different uh, reaction to mice and for example, to you humans, I mean, uh, is I already heard many times that mice, you can do anything in mice that people say, okay, but many times you do something. I, I, I read the other day that cancer was cured in mice or so, something like that. Okay, so here's the thing. First of all, you have to remember, everybody knows that things that work in mice usually don't work in humans but they still carry on um, spending money on experiments in mice. Why do they do that? Very simple answer. Things that work in mice, maybe they usually don't work in humans, but they have a much better chance of working in humans than things that don't even work in mice, right? So you are still saving a lot of money by finding out whether something works in mice, even though it's still a gamble. Um, the second thing to bear in mind is we're talking again about what public, publicly you know, respected people say. I've been out there for 20 odd years saying on stage and on camera that we are close to bringing aging under comprehensive medical control if only people would just get on and spend the money to do the research. But I've been pretty much the only person saying that. Other people with PhDs and professorships at top universities and so on have been much more cautious. Only over the past couple of years, a few people have been getting 
to say something a little bit more like what I've been saying. But even there, you know, some of those people are seen to be, you know, maybe doing it for money. So David Sinclair has this problem right now. He's, you know, a lot of people are saying that he is exaggerating things for his own personal commercial gain. Some people like George Church are getting more optimistic and saying, you know, longevity, escape velocity is a thing and we should, we have a good chance of achieving it fairly soon. Um, but most people are not saying it yet. I think that, that, that so I have to estimate, I have to make a, make a judgment call as to how much more progress we need to make in the laboratory in order that more of the top people in the field will start saying, yeah, you know, we're pretty close. We should really throw proper money at this. And I don't think we need to get very far. I think that the way that I'm defining robust mouse rejuvenation now will almost certainly be enough. So then the question is, what happens next? And the key thing is, what happens with what wide the opinion formers in the wider world say? People like Oprah Winfrey, Ellen DeGeneres. I don't know who the Spanish versions of these people are, right? Um, but if people like that start going on TV and having people like me and George and Matt Cableine and Brian Kennedy and so on, you know, sitting on, on national television and... If the overall, um, you know, reception to this is, you know, we could save some lives. I mean, a lot of lives if we just throw proper money at this. Then the following day, it will become impossible to get elected unless you have a manifesto commitment to do this. That's where I want to get to. But, but Aubrey, I, I mean, uh, now uh, I... I am in this field for I don't know, no, seven years, eight years, and uh, you remember when I started with this, and I, 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 I hear you uh, saying this, this, these things, uh, a, a similar discourse for many years now, and I, I, now I, I think a bit differently, and I would like to know. What do you think about it? Because you have a model of funding that is relatively different than others. For example, companies that are for profit or uh, academia uh, funded by the state. So you uh, have an, a, a non-profit is your third non-profit. So you believe in this in this uh, model of make science, making science. And I now, I think that uh, if you are waiting that with a good result of with mice, the other mechanisms will necessarily uh, make a fast progress. Maybe uh, I, I don't believe it so much. I think your model of, of uh, a non-profit is the model uh, is the best model, and you? I uh, personally think you should you should insist in your foundation going uh, going uh, further. I believe that now. I believe that you 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 should at least to make a plan. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. you can't have a plan in pioneering technology. The only way to maximize the speed at which we achieve this goal, uh, some really ambitious goal like eliminating aging, to minimize the time it takes to get there, is to try a lot of things all at the same time, because you never know what's going to work. So that means you have to mobilize a lot of people. And above all, it means that you have to mobilize a lot of money. Now, I have been trying to mobilize money for a long time. And I have found very clearly that everybody who has money has a different way to be mobilized. So when the um, when some of the areas of sense got far enough along to be investable, everything changed at Sense Research Foundation. 
I'm talking around 2016, 2017. People started coming to me saying, listen, I'm an investor. I don't really want to donate. I will donate. I'll give you a bit of money. But really, I want to invest. And at that, from that point on, we started to spin our projects out as startup companies in order that people would write them bigger checks. Now, it's not just people from Sense Research Foundation. As you know, there have been quite a few um, cases recently of very wealthy people putting serious money into the longevity movement, into the longevity mission. And some of them, in fact, really all of them, all of the big checks, have been for companies that have no likelihood of having any product for many years. So they're not really doing it as companies. They're really kind of doing it quasi-philanthropically. I'm talking about Jeff Bezos and Sam Altman and you know Brian Armstrong. These are people who really want to help. But the fact is, you have to do this. You have to be pragmatic and realistic about how to have a plan to get this done. And the plan cannot be just, you know, some megalithic thing that I say, this is the plan, therefore it is. You have to work with the prejudices, the biases, the preferences of the people who are going to write the checks. But, but don't, don't you think that maybe the reason why uh, these uh, enterprises, for-profit enterprises didn't work, is maybe that when you have a company, a biotech company, you need to keep a lot of secrets. Because if the company publishes every partial result, uh, it uh, maybe it, it don't, don't have anything, have nothing. So... Uh, they keep a lot of secrets. So this uh, in, impairs the possibility of collaboration. If if uh, we had, instead of a lot of companies for profit, we have we had a lot of, of non-profit foundation, uh, every partial discovery could be immediately uh, published. Uh, of course, I completely agree. But that will only happen if people give money to these non-profits. And unfortunately, that's not happening. What happens instead is that people decide to give their money or create a for-profit. And even if they don't need to keep secrets, they still do, maybe. But maybe sometimes they don't. So, for example, the professors at Altos, um, you know, they come and speak at conferences. And they say a fair amount about what they're doing. Maybe there's some things they don't say, but they still say quite a lot. There's a whole conference happening in May called the Rejuvenation Startup Summit, you know, where all of the presenters will be for-profit people, right? Um, so, you know, a lot of, of course, that's part of how you get investment from other from new investors. Is you talk about what you're doing. Um, so it's a balance. Uh, but you're completely right. The ideal scenario would be that nobody would have to worry about secrecy at all. But that's not the real world. Okay, okay, Aubrey. Uh, I think uh, our, our time is is up. Uh, our the time we we talked for this interview. Um, so I will. Uh, I would like to 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 thank you. Uh, thank you, Aubrey. So for your time. Thank you.